I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my statutory interpretation and regulation class, or LEGREG, about Circuit City Stores versus Adams. This is a US Supreme Court case from 2001 about the a used them generous canon. And by the way, I am open to other pronunciation, it's pronunciations of that word. A quick word for my students. Um, this is in a section of our casebook where we talk about the canons of construction. These are sort of maxims or rules of thumb. They're not binding on judges. And so courts follow them inconsistently, but they're, if nothing else, a useful shorthand for a court to explain a sort of nuanced thing that they're doing when they're working with statutory text. Statutory text is sort of like its own genre of literature. It has a structure or template that it usually follows just like sonnets or novels or things like that. And some of these canons of construction actually are really designed to help zero in on and identify um, some of these building blocks of statutes, these everyday, these features that pop up again and again in statutory drafting that maybe we don't see as often in other types of writing, or at least we, the meaning doesn't have to be uh, it, it construed with such high stakes in other types of writing. So let's look at what happens in this case. The other thing that I have to apologize about this case is it's a <clears throat> lot of work sometimes I, for this section of the casebook to work through these really um, tedious cases, some of which I find a little boring, I confess, um, just to get to the fun part about one of the canons of construction, but that's what we're doing. And so we're, uh, let's work through this with Circuit City Stores versus Adams. And this is about arbitration clauses, binding arbitration clauses in employment contracts. So when you go work for uh, somewhere, um, it is your, if you have an, a dispute with your employer, some sort of legal dispute, is there a binding arbitration clause that applies to you? And we start way back in 1925 when Congress actually passed a statute permitting um, binding arbitration called the Federal Arbitration Act. And it was really designed to facilitate arbitration. There was a recognition in the early uh, 20th century that uh, litigation was getting expensive for parties. And so this would make it easier for parties to just drop that clause into their contracts. And then we all know that we're going to have binding arbitration instead of going into court if there's some sort of legal dispute. Um, <clears throat> and so the, it would send subsequent disputes to binding arbitration rather than litigation in court. In other words, Congress intended to encourage arbitration. Now, section two of this Arbitration Act, we have two clauses and that's our problem here. Section two says an arbitration clause in any contract for a transaction involving commerce would be valid and enforceable unless there were grounds for revoking the contract. So if there's independent grounds besides the arbitration clause why the contract is invalid, that's fine and argue that. But if there's not, then if it's a contract involving commerce, then, um, then it's going to be binding. But section one creates an ex exemption. And the exemption is really the sticking point in this case. And that says it doesn't apply to contracts for employment of seamen, that's sailors, railroad workers, or any other class of workers engaged in foreign or interstate commerce. Now I want you to look at what do like sailors and railroad workers have in common. Um, well, you might say, I know it's a small set to work with, that they are going, involved in a type of employment that's crossing jurisdictional lines constantly. And so that sort of changes the calculation for binding arbitration a little bit um, when we are um, unsure where we are going to be when the dispute arises or which jurisdictions, right? If you're a sailor, or even if you're a railroad worker, if you think about it, um, you, the injury and in dispute or the incident at the workplace might have happened in a different state than your home base. 
Okay, but back to the case. The question in Adams is whether a retail clerk at a circuit uh, city store, um, whether their employment contract is covered by the Federal Arbitration Act. And there's two questions here. And the first is whether this would fall under the general language of section two. Do, in other words, does working as a store clerk at Circuit City count, um, involve commerce? And if that's yes, then we can go to the other question that's actually in the previous section of the statute. Does the exemption apply for workers engaged in interstate commerce? Now, the first question, does the Federal Arbitration Act apply at all to um, uh, 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 Circuit City store clerks had sort of been answered by an earlier case called Allied Bruce Terminex Companies v. Dobson. And your opinion in your case book talks about this case. So just let me tell you only what you need to know about that case in order to understand Circuit City uh, versus Adams. The question in Allied Bruce was whether involving commerce in Section 2 meant only those forms of commerce that Congress thought it had the power to regulate in 1925, actual interstate transactions or instrumentalities of interstate commerce, or all forms of commerce that Congress has power to regulate under our sort of modern Commerce Clause jurisprudence. In other words, the dispute in that case, the, one of the parties argued, look, 1925 is before the New Deal, in Congress, um, everybody thought the Commerce Clause was actually something pretty narrow. And if you regulated something about interstate commerce, it meant like interstate shipping of goods or provision of services. Well, as you probably learned in your constitutional law class, um, the, it, the Commerce Clause in the New Deal took on a whole new life of its own. And for a lot of the middle of the 20th century, it seemed like Congress could be, it basically covered everything that Congress wanted to do. So the question is, do we have to go back into the minds of Congress at the time they enacted the Federal Arbitration Clause and look at what was Commerce Clause, what did the Commerce Clause mean back then? Or can we read it, commerce, in light of our modern expansive understanding that everything affects interstate commerce? And Allied Bruce had held that for purposes of the Federal Arbitration Act, the Congress had it, basically their intent was to exercise their power to the full limit of their constitutional authority. And so as those limits expanded due to the, to the changes in Supreme Court Commerce Clause jurisprudence, the cover, uh, coverage of Section 2 expanded along with it. This was a kind of clever result in, Al, in the Allied Bruce case was that Congress, it doesn't matter what they thought the Commerce Clause meant, they just wanted to regulate as much as they could or have the statute cover everything possible. And so as the Supreme Court decided that Congress's power um, was bigger than we had thought before, then the statutes that have been previously enacted basically expanded automatically in their scope to fit that. <clears throat> Now, of course, courts usually don't do that. Usually they try to determine what statutory terms meant to the Congress that enacted them. But instead here, the court concluded that the phrase involving commerce and affecting commerce are statutory terms of art that indicate just nothing more than Congress is legislating to the limits of its constitutional authority. Okay, enough about that other case. Let's talk about the case in our case book, Circuit City Stores. The main question in Circuit City Stores v. Adams then was whether this contract falls under the exception for in section one for contracts for the employment of seamen or sailors, um, railroad employees or other class work of workers engaged in interstate commerce. And here's what the majority concludes. And I have a little quote here that's why we're even reading this case. The wording of section one calls for the application of the maxim a usedom generis, a statutory canon that says where general words follow specific words in statutory enumeration, the general words are construed to embrace only objects similar in nature to those objects enumerated by the preceding specific words. And by the way, that's taken from um, Sutherland's uh, treatise on uh, the canons of construction. 
Um, I'm going to have a separate video, by the way, just about this canon uh, to explain it a little more in depth so that you can understand. I know that this is, can be a little confusing and that some of these Latin phrases all, can start to all sound the same. So let's continue. The court continues, under this rule of construction, the residual clause should be read to give effect to the terms seamen and railroad employees and should itself be controlled and defined by reference to the enumerated categories of workers which are recited just before it. The interpretation of the clause pressed by respondent fails to produce these results. And so in other words, I just wanna remind you that it says there's an exception for sailors and railroad employees engaged in an interstate and other workers engaged in interstate commerce. And the clerk at Circuit Store City was saying that that applies to um, and, yeah, the clerks are the other at, at um, suburban malls are workers engaged in interstate commerce because interstate commerce means anything. And the court here uses this canon to say other workers enjoyed in interstate commerce is talking about people like sailors and railroad employees that might uh, the modern application would probably be interstate um, truckers uh, and um, and so forth who are or those involved in um, uh, cargo planes uh, who fly cargo planes uh, for delivery um, that who basically their work is taking them across state lines kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, and by the way, it, to, in case you're sort of missing the plot here, the um, Circuit City clerk just didn't want to have to go to binding arbitration. They wanted their day in court. And so that's why they're trying to avail themselves with this strained reading of the exemption under the federal arbitration clause. So that if, because if they were sailors, then they could get out of their binding arbitration um, clause and go into court. So basically the clerk thinks that they're not going to get a good result at arbitration and they want to go to court. That's what's kind of really going on here. Um, so the court held that the exemption was limited to the specific listing of prof uh, professions contained in the text. The decision meant that general employment contracts like the one Adams sued under would have to be arbitrated, he loses, in accordance with the federal statute. Okay, that concludes our lecture about Circuit City Stores v. Adams. Um, stay tuned, please watch the video about a usedom generous, which is going to explain it a little bit better than this video did.